This is me playing my favorite game of all time, Riven. Riven is a point-and-click puzzle game released in 1997. Its main hook is the concept of exploration. The game immerses you in a beautiful yet unstable world. A world full of rich nature, lush forests, organic structures, caves and labyrinthian pathways. You even encounter alien animal life. All of which weave an intricate and complex narrative, replete with puzzles, of course, that you as the player have to unravel and navigate. This beast was shipped on five CD-ROMs back in 97, and those CDs were packed with the most well-done realistic graphics that a video game had ever seen up until that point. So good that here I am 27 years later still learning from it by doing a study of one of its frames. And indeed, Riven was one of my biggest inspirations that led me to become an artist myself. But hang on a second. How the f did a game from 1997 accomplish this? I think part of the answer is, back in 97, Cyan couldn't do real-time 3D. At least not in a game with the graphics of Riven. That left them with still pictures. And within that technical limitation came artistic power. Because still images can be composed. So I'd like to look at Riven's compositions in these three categories, value, shape, and color. Starting with value, Riven employs both high contrast and low contrast, and where you find them is very structured. High contrast is used to separate light from shadow, while low contrast is used within light and shadow families. Let's take a look at that. We'll first identify that the sunlight is traveling in this direction, and because of the enclosed space, the light family is relegated to just this area. All right, I'm going to simplify the image and grayscale it off. Here is an average value of the sunlit area, and this is the average value of the shadows. Remember, that's where we'll find the high contrast difference. Now, of course, you have to control the value delineation within those families. Let's start like this. An equal and limited range of value per family. This works, it'll keep your values nice and separate, but Riven and Nature is usually more like this, a wider range of value in shadow and a narrower range in light, giving you a selection of values, or a palette of values, if you will, in this range. Each family, light and shadow, gets a limited selection of values, but with a large gap separating them. Back to our flowchart, this is what I mean by low contrast within families. All right, let's go back to the actual frame here. I'm sampling values directly from the picture, these being shadow values first. It's important to sample from all areas, all materials, and notice how low contrast they are. I'll go ahead and do the same thing with the light family. And while we have made a large jump in value between families, we can see how the values within the light are also low contrast. All right, so I'm gonna get to work on that study. Don't worry, we will talk about color. And even though I'm using color right now, I'm primarily concerned with getting my values in place. I'm using very soft brushes at first to establish that range of low contrast value changes within families. And because this image is dominated by shadow, it makes sense to start with the shadows. There's a bit of sky there just to inform the drawing of the space. But as you can see, I'm doing as much as I can at the start to establish the range of value I will use in shadow. And because I know ahead of time that shadows are allowed a little bit more range than the light, I'm being mindful to establish that while also ensuring that I'm leaving myself plenty of room for that jump between families and then a little bit of room for the light family itself. And speaking of that jump, here it is. This is the first appearance of the light family in this painting. See how effectively it instantly starts reading? Well, that reflects on the smart decisions of Riven's artists. It's also something you see commonly in nature, and it's something I put in my paintings all the time. Okay, we are starting to get a bit more complex with color here, so let's talk about that. But first, a quick word from this video's sponsor. This video is brought to you by Craftsy. I know I'm speaking to other artists out there, and I know that many of us artists are, let's say, creatively curious. I put myself in that category. My creative drive has led me to all kinds of pursuits, like woodworking, 
electronics. Yes, this thing actually works. And of course, drawing and painting. Craftsy nurtures the creative community with driven doers, makers, and DIYers. You'll find over 2,000 classes in more than 20 different categories. There's sure to be something that suits your interests. This traditional cabinet making class helped me build one of my own. Although mine was an arcade cabinet. I also have my daughter's birthday coming up and I'm gonna see if I can use this class to paint a cake for the first time in my life. Craftsy's classes are broken down into short, easy to follow steps. And as a member, you'll even have access to live streaming tutorials where expert instructors share tips, answer questions, and engage with the community in real time. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the video description will get a full one year premium membership to Craftsy for only a dollar and 49 cents. So go check it out. And thanks to Craftsy for sponsoring this video. All right, when it comes to color, there are two important categories color shifts, and environment influence. Colors take their cue from value. So let's carry over this idea of subtle shifts within families. We can take multiple hues like this and make them work together. The problem right there though is saturation. When different hues are too saturated, you destroy the possibility of subtlety. All you have to do is desaturate them. This is the color equivalent of low contrast values. Desaturating colors brings them closer to gray. That gray becomes a unifying force, creating color harmony. And sure, this picture has now become a bit drab because everything is equally gray. But this is where you can zap in just a little bit of saturation, and suddenly you have a statement. The color statements you want to make are driven by the environment influence. If your scene is outdoors, the biggest environment influence will likely be the sky color. Now, you might look at this frame and say there's barely a sky there, but if you look up, that's a lot of blue sky shining down. So let's put our blue swatch there. And what that's going to do is it's going to take a local color, like the cliffs, for example, and it's going to drive it more toward blue. Of course, with subtle shifts along the way. I've just backed up in the demonstration a little bit here, and I want you to look at the top of those posts. Right here, I'm starting to introduce the influence of that sky on the posts, the railings, and the walkway. Here are the specific colors I'm using in that transition. And you notice when they're enlarged like that, they really don't look that blue, but it reads as blue because remember, it's a transition from a base color. My base colors happen to be on the warm side in this case. So my strategy here is to go progressively through the gray with subtle color shifts as I do, and then get more saturated from there. But you notice my blues don't have to be that blue to read as blue. In my actual painting, I could use this color, or rather this series of colors, and it will read as blue because it represents that transition. Riven employs color shifts within families that are just enough to make the image read as colorful, but with the sophisticated control that subtlety brings. An extra impressive achievement given the shading and lighting and rendering technology available back in 1997. The other major piece of environment influence you'll want to consider is bounced light from the sun. Let's go back to an earlier phase in this painting. See how the middle area here is generally warmer? That's because the sunlight will come in here, strike various surfaces, and bounce up. Bounce light from the sun will do the opposite of what skylight does. Let's look at this little slice here, for example. See how that rock is a bit warmer at the top and cooler at the bottom? Well, that's all environment driven. The sun comes in, shining this way, then its light rays bounce up, illuminating and warming up this area of the shadow. Then we've got the sky, which is the opposite temperature. Its light rays come downward, illuminating and cooling this area of the shadow. Now that seems pretty logical, but what you have to do as a painter is have a color strategy for the path you'll take to bridge those two environment influences. And what Riven suggests, and what I suggest, is that when you're crossing from the warm side of the color wheel to the cool side, or vice versa, no matter what the hues are, you don't venture too far from gray, because gray is what keeps things harmonized. All right, let's go back to our flowchart. We still have to get to shape. In general, you have to find a place for big, medium, and small shapes. And the model I've learned to follow looks like this. Just a few big shapes, then more medium shapes, and then exponentially more small shapes. And you have to be very aware of when you're making new shapes. Here's a shape right here. It's basically a single value. So I'll label it one. Here's another shape. 
This is a single but different value. I'll label this two. And of course, we should put a three here for the blank canvas left behind. What about this scenario, though? I think we can agree that that's clearly one shape. But if I do this now, is that a second shape? And is that a third shape? Or is all that close enough in value to still be considered one shape? Well, in the context of a full value painting, I would still call that one shape. If I did this, well, now I have three shapes suddenly, and a fourth shape for the blank canvas. Let's look at that practically with this image here, and we'll just take a small piece of it. I like to start with just two shapes if I can. They are the biggest and highest contrast shapes. They should be undeniably clear and readable, an overall simplified light versus shadow. You should only have a few of these shapes. I have two right there. Then I look for medium shapes. Remember, you can have more of these. I think it's those little crevices that help add character to that rock form. Now for me, this is the most interesting part. I'm looking for a lot more small shapes, and I'm finding them in those small little pieces of light breaking up the shadow at the top there, as well as little incidental bits of shadow at the bottom. Now, to render this out further, remember we have those low contrast value changes within families? Well, here's where they can be applied. If you watch closely, here are some low contrast value changes within the light, and here are some low contrast value changes within the shadow. Now, these low contrast value changes make more shapes, but because they're so low contrast, this is where you can get away with fancy brushes and textures and things like that. But I have a little PSA about this. The precise design of your shapes matters a little less when your values are very close together, since those shapes aren't immediately readable, but you should not ever outright ignore shape design. A good draftsman is in control of every shape they make, which includes knowing when it's appropriate to loosen the reins and when it isn't. So in my study, I'm thinking of that entire cliff wall in shadow, this whole thing, as basically one big shape. Medium shapes include the slices of sunlight on the pathway, the pathway posts, and the sunlight on the cliff face here. Then my small shapes, which come in a much greater number, are scattered generally throughout the focal point. Look for them in these areas. Remember, the higher the contrast, the more carefully you need to design your shapes. A lot of my small shapes here are dappled shadows, which means they have a lot of contrast against the light, so I'm being very mindful that I'm not too repetitive in design, or too equal with spacing, and that the small shapes add that organic and busy feel of nature, which is always very visually interesting against the larger shapes, and it helps the composition feel sufficiently populated. So, here's my final study. And hey, it even got the attention of Cyan itself. I'll take that as an affirmation that I did things right. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Cyan just remade Riven. They gave it the full modern treatment. It just came out like a month ago. And it is truly amazing what they did with the game. I just played through it. You can play in VR if you like. If you like narratives, world building, and puzzle solving, go give Riven a try. Also remember, I have a drawing book coming out in November. Debt-Free Art Degree, Foundations in Drawing. If you pre-order the book, you can get an art review from me by going to marcobucci.com book. All right, I'll see you in the next video.